Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Well, we live in paradise and we have beautiful land, scenery, people, places, wonderful opportunities. The world flocks to Hawaii, most often though for vacation and not really to live here and make a living. One reason, the high cost of living. And an increasingly growing part of the high cost of living is the cost of labor here in Hawaii. Today we're going to talk about something that is a fact of life in Hawaii, and that is the public sector employment that takes place with public sector unions. We're not here to criticize the existence of unions, but ask the question, how long can we go on funding our public sector employment? How sustainable is it given the current model? Uh, the problem is not that our public sector workers make a great deal of money and comprise a great deal of the expenditures of government. The problem is the way we pay them, which is on the backs of everyone, including public sector workers, the backs of taxpayers. There's probably no one who knows this more than Stephen Greenhut, a national expert on public employment, and we're privileged to have him with us today. Uh, Stephen is with the R Street Institute. He's also been uh, a writer for the San Diego Tribune Union, for Reason, Journal, and other publications. He's written a couple of very intriguing books, and you can tell how intriguing they are by the titles. One of them is Abuse of Power, How the Government Misuses Eminent Domain. That was back in 2004, but more recently, he wrote this title, which is germane for today's topic. Plunder, how public employee unions are raiding treasuries, controlling our lives, and bankrupting the nation. That said, regardless of the truth of it, I said, here in Hawaii, Stephen, we still love our unions and our union workers. Please welcome to the program, Stephen Greenhut. Aloha, welcome to Paradise, yeah, Stephen. Yeah, thanks for having me. That may be a devastating thing to hear, welcome to Paradise, because <laughs> you're fairly young at this time. But uh, Stephen, thanks a lot for the work that you do. I appreciate it greatly. Tell me, how did you get started in your interest in public sector employment? Yeah, I was a columnist at the Orange County Register, and I was writing uh, a weekly column and daily editorials, and I kept finding that there were a lot of issues that all came back to the same theme, which was uh, public sector unionization, which there's a big difference between public sector unions and private sector unions. Even the FDR and uh, other uh, famous Democrats question the, uh, the, the, you know, the how, how wise it was to have public sector unions. Well, you know, that's interesting because sometimes people don't realize that there is a difference between public sector unions and private sector unions. And, and in terms of paying for the labor and the benefits, what's the fundamental difference between the two kinds of unions? Well, the taxpayers fund everything that the mm -hmm. government does. So in the private sector, you can't kill the host. If you're, a, I grew up in a union area in uh, in Pennsylvania, and in the private sector, uh, you know, there's a, there was always a realization that you have to help make the enterprise succeed, and I think that it has led to uh, you know a better situation, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, of labor relations. And the and the public sector, what I find happening is the unions will elect a politician to a to an office, city council, county board of supervisors, state legislature. And then the unions negotiate, they represent the workers, and then the unions negotiate essentially with themselves. And it becomes this one-way ratchet, and often the uh, legislators will, will partake in some of the benefits that the unions are able to get, and there's nobody at the table representing taxpayers. So this is a problem here because the taxpayer doesn't get represented in this formula, and ultimately the taxpayer is the one who pays for the salaries and the benefits. Right, because everything on, a, you know, if you, uh, where, where I grew up, U.S. Steel Company, and there were some others, and, and there were some, you know, there were some issues that people could raise about uh, private sector unions, but that company had to make a profit for everyone to succeed. And here, the public sector, the money just comes from the taxpayer, so we create this one-way ratchet there's more and more pressure for tax increases and what what concerns a lot of people I found in California a lot of uh, liberals and conservatives are pushing for pension reform and public sector reform because what it's doing is it's obliterating public services if you run out of money uh, something has to happen so what happens the services get cut um, sometimes uh, in, in the areas I've covered, we've, we've had cities that have gone bankrupt. So you're talking about the sustainability issue. In, in other words, there are certain goods we get from the way in which we fund public sector workers, but if we're running out of money, 
if the cost is so high, we ultimately are going to be cutting public services. And, and that means we're also potentially cutting public sector jobs. Well, well yeah, and that, but that's one of the issues. I mm -hmm. mean, there was one city manager in California who, uh, in frustration, he told the newspaper, he said, well, cities have become pension providers that provide a few public services on the side. That's not how it should be. And the other thing, another point that I make a lot, and, and I do in my book, Plunder, is the u public sector unionization makes it impossible to reform things. And, and we see it in the state capitol in California, and I know the uh, politics are rather similar here. Uh, the unions basically control the place. So whenever there's something like uh, a reform of education reform, uh, some of the, the schools, especially the ones that cater to the poorest students, it's re they get they get the worst teachers, right? They get the they're they're the dumping ground, and you can't reform those things because of the the opposition uh, from the unions. We see this on uh, police abuse issues, um, and I've written extensively about that. Often, it's there's a small number of police that commit uh, pr problems are 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 the source of many problems and settlements with cities. You can't get rid of them. And that's because of many of the union protections. So you're right, there's the sustainability, but it's not just a financial issue. It's also a public services. And the, and the government isn't here to be just a source of employment for people. That, that's not what the government's supposed to do. Uh, it's supposed to provide services. It's supposed to take care of the infrastructure. In California, our infrastructure is crumbling. We never have... Uh, you know, I, I don't live that far from the dam that was, was having some uh, failure mm -hmm. issues not that long ago. Well, there's always money to give raises to public sector workers, and there's never money to maintain our infrastructure. So it's a public service issue. It's also a fairness issue. Um, you know, in some cities uh, that I've covered, the, the, pu the average public sector worker makes multiples, if you include their benefits, of what the average sure. person, and that's not how it's supposed to be. So there are myriad issues. It's not just a sustainability issue, but it is, of course, a sustainability well, issue. Well, I'm glad you clarified that, uh, because these issues often work in counterproductive ways. For example, teachers who are highly devoted to their work for the most part, and I think for, for the most part people don't go into public school teaching unless they have a level of dedication to education. They see the problem of a lack of services and resources to carry out their mission, and so they go to bat for higher wages uh, by calling upon taxpayer legislators to increase taxes and so forth. And, and yet, the fiscal side isn't necessarily going to translate into solutions for the operations of the schools because, as you point out, union worker benefits and work rules and so forth may prevent the kind of reforms that are needed. So oh, well, uh, how do you, do you see this circle throughout the country? Oh yeah, it's everywhere. Now it's obviously in uh, deep blue states like California mm -hmm. and Hawaii and Illinois and New Jersey uh, where unions have more power. It's more pronounced than in some of the right to work states in the deep south, but it's the, it's the same idea. And what a good example of what, what you were just talking about, I've, I've covered many school bond issues when I was at the Orange County Register local school bonds. So, uh, so what happens is uh, the teachers unions and the locals will say, hey, we don't have money uh, to repair these crumbling schools, and often they are crumbling schools. Um, so what happens, they, they float a bond. And then as soon as the bond passes, they pass a, a project labor agreement, which then gives, uh, right. gives uh, all the work essentially to the unions. And that, that shaves 30% of the money, that just throws it away. Now, if, okay, I could see if you're a union member, you say, hey, now I'm going to get the job and I'm going to uh, get the extra money. But it reduces uh, the amount of money that goes to the actual school facilities construction. And it, it's a good example. So all these work rules, all these union work rules, all these special privileges, such as the PLAs, it just makes it harder and harder to improve the infrastructure. And the goal of the public sector is to provide services. It's not to provide good jobs for people. Now, a booming economy in the private sector is what's supposed to provide good jobs for people. Well, you know, on that point, let's talk a little bit more about the sustainability financially sure. of what's going on. Right now, it's no secret that our states are struggling with unfunded liabilities, particularly in terms of union public sector pension programs. What's going on there? What's the relationship between the pension programs and massive unfunded liabilities in the state? Okay, well, and for, for listeners who aren't as familiar, an unfunded liability is really a debt. 
It's the amount of money uh, the, uh, that uh, we're short to pay for all the promises. We, the government, are, you know, the taxpayers, right. we're short to pay all the promises made to current workers and uh, retirees. So Hawaii's system is 54% is funded. So that now, let me just stop yeah, you there yeah. for a moment. 54% funded. Now, we may get used to hearing that when it comes to government uh, pension programs. But in the private sector, suppose you had a private insurance program that you'd been contributing to. Uh, how funded are they typically in comparison? Well, as I understand it, a private insurance program should be fully funded. Fully right? funded a, and right. sometimes well beyond that. I know mine <laughs> is several... Uh, percentage points well beyond fu fully funded. Well, and the reason is an unfunded liability, that's the portion that the taxpayers have to pick up. Now, I hear from uh, union people say, oh, well, um, you know, these systems are self-sustainable. Well, no, the unfunded, when there's an unfunded pension liability, that's the, that means it's not sustainable. Anything less than 100%, that means that portion, uh, the taxpayer is going to have to uh, pick up the slack. Now, there's a game that goes on. Uh, because now in my uh, 401k style program, um, what happens is I put in some money, the employer puts in some money. If the stock market goes up, I get more money in my account and presumably can retire with more. If it goes down, oh well, I might not be able to have as nice of a house in retirement or, or whatever. And that it's different in the pub. That's because it's a defined contribution. So the amount, the employer knows how much he has to contribute, that's defined and a defined benefit, that's what the public sector has. That means the employee is promised a rate of return based on a formula. So that, that promise, they can't take that away. That's what you're going to get. So the so money you, has that to promise, come from somewhere. There's an obligation to pay that promise. That's correct. The, pub, the taxpayers have to pay that promise, regardless of what happens in the market, regardless of the performance of the portfolio, re regardless of a whole myriad of other factors. Exactly. So the money, the pension funds take the money and they invest it. Mm -hmm. And then they predict a, a rate of return. Now in California, it was 7.75%. Uh, they just reduced it to 7.5, and then they're going to reduce it to 7 in, in a several years, presumably. Uh, now, first off, that's a really aggressive rate of return. I mean, if most of us knew a place we could put our money and get a guaranteed amount like that, uh, we would just do that and not bother doing what most of us do, which is invest in different, in different things. So, so they play the game. It's a political decision what the rate of return is going to be. Um, so in California, we've had some of the actuaries arguing that it needs to be much lower than that. Some argue it needs to be closer to the Treasury rate, uh, you know, which is a, a risk-free rate. Uh, instead, so, so they, they assume this large rate of return and then have to make increasingly aggressive investments to, to meet that. Now, in California, the last year I think was less than 1% rate of return. That means the unfunded liabilities, which is just a fancy word for debt, and the unions will tell you, oh, it's not a real debt. Oh, it's a real debt. If, if it's not a real debt, then we, we wouldn't presumably have to pay for it. In so, some states, in fact, the, the state constitution requires that that debt be paid for uh, prior to other expenditures. Well, so and, it's going to really fall on the backs of the taxpayers. Yeah, it's, it is the, it's the preeminent thing that has to be paid. So everything else gets cut after that. So what we get is this, uh, if you lower the, re the predicted rate of return, that unfunded liability number goes up. So it's variable. In California, I've heard um, anything from $160 billion to a trillion dollars. It all depends on what your guess at the future rate of returns, which, which what's, what it's doing in California and it, it will do here in, in Hawaii is the local governments are going to have, they have to pay more, they have to contribute more to the pension system, and sometimes they're contributing 50% of an employee's uh, pay just to, to pay for that pension contribution. That comes right out of the hide of services. Now, at the state level, the state uh, generally doesn't contribute a ton. Uh, in California, it's a few billion dollars. It's not insignificant, but the real problem's at the local government. So, well, yeah. Stephen, when we take a, uh, after we come back from a break, I want to ask you what some of the solutions are. My guest is Stephen Greenhut, an expert in public sector employment, and we're going to take a look at some of the ways we can get out of the unsustainable situation we're in in paying for wages, benefits uh, for our public sector workers. We'll be right back on Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako after this short break. Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna, and I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I invite you to come watch our show on thinktechhawaii.com. 
You can also see our shows on YouTube as well, if you can Google search those. I appreciate the time. I hope that you do join us as we learn about education, about the educational system here in Hawaii, what the challenges are, what the benefits are, and how much our kids are learning. So thank you. I hope you join us. Hello, my name is Crystal. Let me tell you, my talk show, I'm all about health. It's healthy to talk about sex. It's healthy to talk about things that people don't talk about. It's healthy to discuss things that you think are unhealthy because you need to talk about it. So I welcome you to watch Quok Talk and engage in some provocative discussions on things that do relate to healthy issues and have a well-balanced attitude in life. Join me. Welcome back to the second portion of Ehana Kako for this week. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. I'd like to say a big mahalo to the Think Tech Hawaii staff, to Jay Fidel and everyone who works in this studio, producing about 30 to 35 hours of original content every week. You can see it at thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, these programs cover everything from politics to music to the arts, travel, business, sports, ethics, technology, science, you name it. Think Tech Hawaii is covering it, and we're glad to be part of that program. My guest today, Stephen Greenhut, is an expert in public sector employment. And there's no secret to those of us in Hawaii that we've got to revamp our system. We've got important public services, uh, we've got valuable public employees, and we've got the general public who all may suffer unless we find a more sustainable way to fix the system, especially the way we can afford pensions and other benefits that go to se private sector workers, public sector workers. Now, uh, we're going to go back to Stephen because I've got an interesting question I do want to ask him. He's come up with several solutions based upon best practices across the nation. But first, let me ask you, Stephen, as we come back into this final segment, what are some of the things that Hawaii really needs to look out for? As, as you've seen some horror stories, if you will, taking place with the management of uh, public sector benefits and, and salaries across the nation. Right, we've, what we've seen is an incredible uh, amount of, um, of spiking, pension spiking. That's when public employees at the last year or several years of their service will, will uh, they will engage in certain enhancements. You get special management pay for being a manager. Sure. Or you, it's ridiculous. It's just ways to gin up the, the final uh, payment. There are all sorts of, uh, I've, I wrote about uh, some, uh, uh, everyone in one police department was getting these promotions. So there were so many, pro so many people promoted to a high, higher level position that you didn't even know who was really serving in that position. It was just a way to permanently enhance their benefits. So the incentive system kind of promotes this kind of gaming of the system. That's right. It's gaming. And we see uh, the disability system, right? We, um, in, in the private sector, if I'm disabled, it's an insurance claim, where in the public sector it goes to a board, which is usually dominated by public employees, and the standards are much lower. So we have something in California called chief's disease. Virtually every police chief retires with a disability, and that protects 50% of their their uh, pay from uh, taxes. So we see these kind of things doubling and tripling up. I, uh, the, the LA Times just had a story about a, um, a police official who he had a pension from one uh, fund and then he got one from another and then he was getting another salary and he's pulling down you know almost five hundred thousand dollars a year. We have these uh, programs where people are able to bank some of the retirement while they're still working and they walk away with million dollar payouts. In California that you're your average uh, pay and benefit package for firefighters over $175,000 a year. And uh, some of that's, uh, you know, playing around with overtime. There are all these things, and it costs the public. I mean, when you look at, look at the amount of money. So, um, and these, are, these benefits are going to be paid until the person passes away and his or her spouse passes away. So these are dollars that go on for a long time. And uh, I, had, uh, I had some folks, uh, it was a union guy, I was on a program, and he was saying, well, police die three to five years after they retire, that's why they get such uh, lush pensions. And then I did all the research with the, the retirement system. It turns out the longest living category of public employee is a police officer followed by a firefighter. They live to be in their mid-80s. So I wish everyone a long, healthy, and prosperous life, but the fact is actuaries have to consider how long they're going to live and they, these are massive payments and they're millionaires pensions consider how much money would you need in the bank 
to have a hundred and fifty thousand dollar retirement at age fifty until you're eighty five and until you're until your spouse passes away quite a few millions yes it would be yeah, in some cases eight to ten million dollars so these these so and then compare that to the private sector in Hawaii private sector workers are among the lowest paid in the, in the nation. So, so some guy or woman who's working really hard on a low paid job has to work harder uh, and then has to suffer with worse, uh, worsening public services. It's a fairness issue too. Well, you, you come from California, Orange County, where, where you saw an entire county go bankrupt because of its fiscal practices not being sustainable. Now while states don't go bankrupt, they have other ways of feeling the pain. Are there union workers, public sector w union workers across the nation who are getting nervous themselves about the sustainability of, of their benefits? Well, some. There are too few. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Ar Orange County's bankruptcy in 94, and I came to Orange County um, after that, and, but that was a, it was a unique set of circumstances uh, that wasn't related. Uh, it was related to investments, but not pensions. Uh, when I was down in Orange County, and I'm in Sacramento now, uh, there was a union official who was supportive of some reforms. I've met some union officials who, who are supportive of, of modest reforms, but the system needs more than modest reform. It needs major reform, and, and you're rarely going to get a, a union uh, worker. Not too many politicians are willing to do it. They have to pay a price. Well, give us some of these impossible solutions. What would be one way that we, we could fix the system so that it's sustainable for union workers, but it doesn't break the backs of public taxpayers? Well. As far as solutions, the thing with solutions, mm -hmm. and people always say, how come, how come you don't have more solutions? Well, you and I could probably sit down and come up with some, some technical solutions, right? You basically have to reduce the amount of payouts. Right. I think uh, even Governor Brown in California once proposed a blended system where part of it would be a 401k style uh, program. At least this way the agency uh, knows how much they're going to be on the hook for. So moving to more of a, a, of a defined contribution type system, you could end pension spiking practices. You could you can transfer the disability system that we've discussed to more of a of a insurance type program. Uh, there are all sorts of ways of, of just basically trimming the amount of benefits, increasing the contributions from the employees. Uh, a lot of times the unions say, hey, these systems, as I mentioned, are self-sustaining. Well, let's make them actually self-sustaining. So if the system has a large liability, then the beneficiaries should be paying more. There are a lot of those types of things. Now, privatization is another really good thing. In Sandy Springs, Georgia, which privatized its city government, they don't have unfunded pension liabilities. Well, and that's a very interesting case in point. Uh, we, we've actually sent our research director here at the Grassroot Institute to Sandy Springs to do an extensive study, and uh, those of you who are interested in knowing about it can go to our website, grassrootinstitute.org, and watch a very fascinating documentary about Sandy Springs, the city that privatized everything virtually. Ninety-five percent of its services are actually contracted out, and as a result, it's making a profit, which is incredible. So how, how does this work? I mean, now, I don't see this as an immediate solution in Hawaii, but maybe there are some sectors where we could see this taking place, like our public hospitals and so forth. But what happens when the city and county or the state government are no longer the employer, but they contract out the entire service uh, to a firm that gets it by competitive bid, and the firm is the employer. Right, they can't, they can't run up unfunded pension liabilities is the main thing, and often you'll find that they'll provide better services. Now, I worked uh, years ago when I, when I was a young man, I uh, worked on a military base that was, uh, had three private contractors who, who, it was a testing facility, and they each had a different portion of the contract, and every five years it went out to competitive bid. And those, those contractors wanted to make sure they were lean, and provided uh, the best possible services. Um, so, so there's a competitive factor. Now, privatization isn't the true private sector. It's not a competitive. Sure. It's partially competitive, but it's, you don't have a willing buyer or willing seller. You're, you live in the city, but I do believe that there are certain services that have to be done by the public sector. These are really good ideas, but the point I was going to make is if we could come up with solutions. The problem is political. And so I think we first have to deal with political solutions. And one of those solutions um, it deals with how unions are able to raise money and fund 
political campaigns. So, uh, you know, paycheck protection has been called in the past, or there's a, a court case uh, that's winding its way up to the U.S. Supreme Court that uh, would limit the ability of unions to just take money uh, mandatorily from uh, their employees because then they're able to use the bulk of that money. Some of it goes to collective bargaining, uh, but they're able to, uh, you know, there's one, they're supposed to, um, in California certainly, and, and I think, yeah, nationwide, they're not allowed to use all the money for politics. You're allowed to opt out, essentially, but there's a case that would challenge that ability. Um, but, but the point is, if the unions didn't have such an easy time taking money from their employees, and the government does it for them, they wouldn't have as much money to spend on politicians and on politics, and that might make it easier to reform some of these things. So I think there's a political problem before we even get to the solutions, because we've been, now in California, we've had initiatives uh, that have passed, and then uh, the courts have thrown them out because we have something called the California Rule, uh -huh. which means you can't cut back public sector benefits even going forward. So I worked once for a, a place where I had a small pension, and I had a, I had got a pension, and up, up, as of today, they ended that pension, and I got a lower rate starting tomorrow. They're not taking anything away from me. It's just future earnings. If I don't like the deal, I can get a job somewhere else. Uh, that's not allowed in California, which means the only reforms we're able to do it, are ones for new hires. So that's not going to start paying off for 30 years until those new hires start uh, retiring. Well, as we wind up, how long can we sustain this in our country? As you look across the nation, you know, at some point we're going to hit a breaking point. Uh, and when do you ex anticipate that may occur? And how do you think we'll be able to respond to it? You know, that's, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, what, what I see happening, which I think is in some ways the worst of all worlds, is just mm -hmm. a slow, steady destruction of public services. And we had a, a burgeoning pension reform movement in California and it, a lot of folks at the time were thinking, we're going we're gonna to have a day of reckoning and we're going to fix this. And, and that whole reform movement kind of fizzled out after taxpayers agreed to a tax hike. But the problem is it's hard to get to that. We're not at that point where, we're, where everything's going to explode. Well, yeah. Fascinating. Stephen, what's the full title of your book, Plunder? Plunder. Uh, oh, you, uh, uh, Here we go. How, okay. how government employees are. Uh, how public like employee unions, unions are raiding treasuries, controlling our lives, and bankrupting the nation. I and people can get that on Amazon. It's too Stephen long of a Greenhut. subtitle. Well, very good. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Thanks for being in Hawaii. I, I look forward to the consultations we're going to have here and some of the presentations and appreciate your work. Well, thank you. Aloha. Well, my guest today, Stephen Greenhut of the R Street Institute, uh, has been sharing some of his insights that he gets from observing public employment across the nation. Again, the issue I is not that public employees uh, don't deserve good pay and benefits. They certainly do. But we've got to come up with a way of being able to provide them and ensure public services, as well as to ensure the full value to taxpayers. That's one of the tricky problems as Stephen points out, of a world that is full of politics. We are in a political world. Let's see what we can do to help uh, make it produce the outcomes that are good for everyone. I'm Keili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. We'll be back next week on Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. Until then, signing off from the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, aloha.